Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Bible and Archaeology podcast, the place for anything and everything related to the Bible and archaeology. I'm Jordan Jones. I'm here with Dr. Bob Cargill, and we have one of those uh, anything related to <laughs> topics for you today. Some news question mark uh, quotes around that, maybe how we want to define that some news about the shroud this week that we're gonna get into what it says and what it doesn't say, Bob. Thanks for coming. Yeah, happy to be here. Um, people know that I, I've done this for a while, and when I go on TV, sometimes they ask me to talk about some new discovery. Sometimes they ask me to talk about something that's possible, and sometimes it's to go on aliens and to talk, you know, to debunk this stuff or to talk about no, this isn't, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And this, today's topic is one of those no, no, you didn't episodes. So I don't want to start off sounding like a, you know, sounding like a debunker, sounding like a, you know, a skeptic, but that's what this is. And but, that's what we need to address. Yeah. And this is, this topic, the, the stories about it are a little bit of all of that with the, is this new with the way they're positioning it? The find isn't new, but the way that they're studying it is. And so what they're bringing and how it is, we're going to cover all of the bases. So we're mm -hmm. going to go through what it says, what it doesn't say, what you need to know. But we're happy to have you here with us wherever you're finding us, whether that's on Apple or on Spotify or here on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe wherever you find us. That helps us and that helps you stay in touch whenever we have new things coming out for you. And it's the start of term for us here at the University of Iowa. So if you see, you know, any uh, uh, tiredness in the eyes, it's just joy from the beginning of the school year <laughs> and getting back into classes. I mean, we love being in class and this is the kind of stuff that comes up in class all the time that people come to you and ask on a daily basis, hey, Bob, I saw this or Dr. Cargill, what's going on with this thing? And that's what we're here to do with all of you. I'm already getting questions about it, but uh, no, the, another semester has begun and I'll lose a little more hair and it'll turn a little whiter. So let's jump right into the shroud and can you set the stage a little bit for people that maybe have heard this name in passing, Sure, but it's one of those, yeah, I've heard this mentioned with maybe, you know, the grail or something, but I don't actually know what this thing is, Bob. What is the shroud? When did it show up? What do we need to know about the background of this object? Sure. The shroud of Turin is exactly what it, it its name says that it is. It is a shroud, a burial shroud, a, a piece of cloth that is purported to have been the piece of cloth in which Jesus, this is Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, was buried. So this is a piece of cloth that was said to have been laid over him. Uh, and it has what is said to be an image of Jesus. Specifically, it's got something of, on it. It, it, it's, it's got a face on it. And so you've got this 14 something, 14 foot long piece of cloth, right? Linen cloth with a face on it. And people say, well, clearly this is the face of Jesus. At least that is the legend as it was passed down from generation to generation. Now, many people say, okay, stop, stop right there. <laughs> If you wrap somebody for burial, and people instantly think like a mummy, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, but that's typically how you think of it. And then you unwrap these wrappings, like the Gospels say, it's not going to be a 14 foot long piece of, you know, rectangular piece of cloth with a face. And again, it, it, it it's like an ochre colored, you know, impression mm -hmm. and it's going to, and it's got eyes and a crown of thorns and it all just you know, like blasts onto the, like a shadow, you know, blasts onto yeah. there. And this is, you know, the miracle of the shroud. So it, it, if it sounds too good to be true, this is because, and let's just say it right up front. It is, this thing is not genuine. It's not real. It's fake. I mean, it's a real cloth. It's a piece it's, of cloth. The, the object exists. Yes. What and, has been brought to it? 
question marks. Yeah, and it's got an image on it, and mm -hmm. it's a person. But it's a the, bit of a Rorschach test if you're looking at it. If you want to see how much do you want to see if it's a crown of, right? So there is a little bit of this, if you go to look up photos of this, sometimes depending on the way has been, the way the photo has been colorized or edited, yeah. it can stand out more or less. And what part of this are we looking at? That there's something, you, there, there's discoloration there. But let's be honest, it was produced to look like the face of a crucified Jesus. So the whoever produced this, and, and let's just call it a forgery. It was a medieval forgery. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a medieval forgery. But whoever produced the Shroud of Turin was attempting to create something that looked like it would have been the face of Jesus. And in that part, they were, they were somewhat successful because you can see the outline of a face. Mm -hmm. But uh, through this long convoluted story, it ends up today in Turin, where it, uh, Torino, right? Where it, uh, where it is a holy relic. And the debate is, you know, is this thing a medieval forgery or could it actually have been the shroud that covered Jesus? At least that's how it's marketed to get hundreds of thousands of pilgrims to come in and buy tickets and to spend money and to see this thing which is what the purpose of a lot of these religious relics really is. But that, I think that's the controversy. It's worth emphasizing here. You're talking about the date of this. The shroud mm -hmm. just kind of comes onto the scene in the 1350s that it doesn't, I mean, that's a long history, you know, if you're thinking from yeah. now until then, but that it does just show up one day in 1354, I think is the date that normally gets positioned to it, where somebody comes yeah. along to present it to the dean of the church and says, hey, looky, looky, what I have, isn't mm -hmm. this really great? And that's the beginning, which I think for some people, they think the debunking of this is such a new thing. But from no. the beginning, there were questions of its legitimacy, and it was not seen as legitimate almost from the outset. Yeah, and it wasn't coming from, you know, agnostic scholars and skeptics, it was coming from people in the church, right? The, the, who, the Pope. Who were rejecting this. Yeah, like like who? Who who would have been the ones rejecting this? Like, uh, yeah, Pope Clement VII, who <laughs> describes it to be not the true. So it, yeah, in case you're immediately going down to the comments to say you're just, hey, hey, what, we're looking back to the Pope. We're, we're looking right. back to the Pope for some of our information as far as right how how we're viewing this, but it hasn't always been viewed the same. So if you're looking at the mm -hmm. way popes have talked about it over time, sometimes the language of how they're addressing it or how reverent they are to it has moved depending on their perspective on the object and what it can do. And so one of my favorite details, before we move into the new thing, you know, just in the history, you know, the lore of the shroud, as you go through this stuff, my favorite thing is that in 1453, the granddaughter of the person who first brought it, uh, mm -hmm. got in trouble for trading it for two castles, and as a result, <laughs> got excommunicated. So like, you know, the history of this thing, like, yeah, it's the burial cloth of Jesus, and how much are you gonna give me for it? One castle, no, no, no. Two castles, we maybe we have a deal here. So there's been a long uh, exchanging of hands, debate, <sighs> dealing, it's wheeling currency. and dealing. It is. It's currency. If you can break off a, a thorn from the crown of thorns and use that, and and we were selling off debts in medieval times for you know for trading this thing, you know the in uh, in 1389 Bishop uh, Pierre d'Arcy de Troyes, he declared it. This is a bishop uh, says that this is fake, and you're just using it to to raise money, right? So it's it. These are bishops and popes who are saying this thing's fake. And of course, they're going to come along and, and construct like we do with any uh, artifact, even today that uh, suddenly appears on the black market. They're going to construct some backstory. And well, no, here's the legend of how mm -hmm. it popped up in the 14th century. You know, it, Joseph of Arimathea got it and or Mary Magdalene got it and he, she gave it to him and, and it's going to, you know, have this artificial chain of custody and who magically brought it to this guy. And it's been here ever since. Right. So they have to construct this this backstory. But of course, um, who's going to argue with whatever whatever authority is there at the time who's saying no, if you can get a pope or a bishop to say, no, this is actually 
potentially legit or you know who knows maybe it is so let's let's if you can get that for enough time it it adds it a, a air of legitimacy mm-hmm. and then it comes down to the science which and is so, where we're going to jump in now this this science you've got that long backstory there's places you can go to read through that it's a fascinating tale but this week we're talking about the shroud this week because for some reason a journal article from 2 years ago Right. 2022 started to make the rounds. Somebody picked it up. Somebody published the first story. And from there, it's gone to all kinds of different sites. This isn't just uh, the Daily Mail is talking about it. I mean, the Daily Mail did talk about it. Right. But they, in addition to a bunch of other places, started to look towards this story about the claim right. from that, that this, using new technology, using a new type of X-ray, Right. Right, looking to the science to say, how can we use this new methodology to try to date this? And so they used what they call wide angle X-ray scattering, right? It sounds mm-hmm. really fancy, which automatically means a good. Also, an important thing to know about this is it's a new technique, right? So there's not a lot of people that can speak to it right now, right? Or a lot of other examples that can be turned to, which we'll come back to later, right? But they say the experimental results are compatible with the hypothesis that the shroud is a 2,000-year-old relic as supposed by Christian tradition. So they say, we did some scans here. We scanned another piece that they place at Masada, and they say the dating between the two of these things comes together. Look, this is 2,000 years old, in spite of the consensus position that this isn't. Right. So, just a couple of things before we move on. Number one, this article that they're that they're that's making the rounds in the news is a couple of years old. This thing came out a couple of years ago, but sure enough, here we are, you know, heading back into school. Uh, it's getting picked up and pushed into the news, and now it's making the rounds, which just shows you marketing's a big deal. Uh, if you have a claim, if you have a story and you put it, publish your article, but it doesn't get marketed and it doesn't get picked up, try, try again. And if you get your timing just right and you get the right people to pick up the story, then it can make the rounds, especially if it's something having to do with not just Jesus, but the face of the Jesus. The face. Well, and, I'm you know, shocked this, that it's it's not Easter, that this is coming no. out <laughs> now in August. This right. feels like an Easter time push. But. Usually when it's a non-Easter or non-Christmas push, and by the way, please keep in mind, I I I will admit to this, when you see my face on television, it's usually right there on Easter or right there around Christmas, because that's when these documentaries about Jesus air. We we do this deliberately. The, the networks do this deliberately. They're going to film these things, and they're going to have them set so that they can air when they're going to get the maximum interest from an audience Christmas and Easter. Christmas and Easter, Christmas and Easter. That's when all the shows that I'm on or the, the reruns or the, that's when they're going to, that's what they're, you're going to see. You're going to see biblical scholars talking about Jesus on Christmas and Easter. Now, because it's happening in August, my guess is uh, a book or my guess is there's going to be some other, some other play going on here. So just, just heads up. But I, I, I think there's something else going on here. But I also say that the Shroud of Turin has this group that is perpetually trying to restore its reputation because years ago, a decade ago, there was scientific study done of the actual uh, material of, of mm-hmm. the blood. And it was ochre. It, it's, it's, it's medieval. They, they did a, a definitive study and this is a medieval production. Which the you know the loyalists to the tr- shroud will say, oh, it was contaminated. That was a that was a bad methodology. That was bad. So groups have been coming along trying to use different approaches to re-examine this, as if to say, no, 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 we did a new science. You have to stay within science now. A new scientific test that, that maybe sheds light on the possibility that it might be uh, authentic, and it's just not. But if we can find some kind of of test and and compare it, and that's what's going on. It's an article from a couple of years ago where they didn't come out and say the Shroud of Turin is authentic. They didn't name Jesus, right? But they said, 
it could be 2,000 years old. It appears to be, based on our technique, 2,000 years old. And, that, and then it comes down to looking at the scientific methodology used, and that's where this, that's where this uh, article falls apart. The, the not naming Jesus part is, if you read the article, you can go, the article is mm -hmm. open source, you can go and access it. It's not extremely long. The majority of it deals with their process. Right. But if you just read the introduction, as they talk about the shroud, it's widely studied. When they describe it, they say the ancient linen cloth, which wrapped the corpse and encoded the image of a tortured man who was scourged, crowned with thorns, crucified, and pierced by a spear in the chest. They don't name the individual, but the second sentence in, there, there's a bit of a tip of the hand, I would say, yeah. from the beginning of the identification that we're wanting you to make in this picture. They're clearly talking about Brian, right? This is Brian, Brian of Nazareth. It, no, they're, they, they're, they're hinting at it, but then they could say, no, we didn't say we're saying it was Jesus. We, we're not saying that. It, it's, it's, um, we're not this, saying it's as, Jesus. As soon as you we're do Jesus. that, as soon as you say that, I'm not saying that, uh, uh, that, uh, what was the one where the, the air blast thing where it, it destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, but they did everything mm. but say this was an air blast that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. They just suggested that, you know, this is all possible without ever saying Sodom and Gomorrah. And therefore, you know, it's more credible. They're suggesting that the Shroud of Turin is the face of Jesus. They're suggesting it's authentic. At least that's the that's what they want all their readers to jump to. That's the conclusion they want them to reach. It is important to also note, right? They they do they place that conclusion for you up front mm -hmm. with right. the dating that they want to establish. Right. Again, if you read the whole article, you'll find the expected hedgings on that position where they're 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 not backing away from the claim. But they are, you know, talking about their conclusions and maybe some of that it's older than this, so we can argue this, but this methodology is also new. So yeah, before you can totally pin this down, you might need some more, which if you're just seeing this coming across in a different headline, a, a news story headline of this, that's buried down in page nine or 10 mm -hmm. after they're talking about how they're using the x-rays. Right. And that's the part that gets skipped over. But in right. the article, right, they're arguing, yeah, it's really old. They also acknowledge, mm, we can't really like definitively say because they're trying to publish this and they're going to have to hedge. But they also acknowledge maybe not quite as old. But there's another point about the age of this, Bob, that they don't get into that you were mentioning earlier that I, I think is worth noting as well regarding just the material, like the structure of the shroud as well. Yeah. And this goes back to a, a colleague that I uh, had the opportunity that had the pleasure of interviewing back in 2010, which I was younger and again, had more hair. Um, this is Orit Shamir, and she worked at the time for the uh, for the Israel Antiquities Authority for the group. I think it was for the Organic Materials or the Organic Preservations Group. Uh, and this is this is her wheelhouse, her area of expertise. If it's an organic material, if it's a piece of cloth, a leather shoe, something like that, she's the expert, right? And she wrote an article in 2015. And its title was A Burial Textile from the First Century CE in Jerusalem Compared to Roman Textiles in the Land of Israel and the Turin Shroud, right? So this is about a decade old, and she was looking at some, some of these textiles, some of these uh, pieces of linen, and what she was analyzing was the way that they were woven. So uh, forget the ochre, forget the the ink, you know, the, mm -hmm. the that was used to represent the blood of Jesus on this thing. Forget the carbon fourteen. Dating. She actually said, "Let's look at how it was woven," and she went through it and examined in all of her studies, all of her research, every piece of linen that came out of Israel at that time. So you know, up into the Roman period, from the Roman period going forward, and she and she talks about this, and she talks about. Uh, how, how tight the weave was, 
uh, was it an was it a um, Z spun weave or an S spun weave? And we don't have to get into the technical details of it, but there's different ways of weaving material together. Mm-hmm. And what she said is the Turin shroud is made of linen Z spun in a three one herringbone twill pattern. All the linen textiles from the land of Israel until the medieval period are S-spun plain weave tabby. A a few wool textiles from the Roman period are Z-spun in both warp and weft, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, what she goes on to conclude, and this is down uh, in section 10 of her article, is uh, the Akodama shroud is Z-spun, but most of the textiles in the land of Israel from the Roman period are S-spun. Uh, she says, uh, plain weave or tabby was the most common weave for garments and others used, including the shrouds. Twill is tighter form and must um, be more able to stand uh, greater wear than tabby. And then she goes down to say, the number of threads per centimeter is lower than that of the Turin shroud, which is a 3-1 herringbone twill pattern with high density of threads. And so what she's ultimately saying is the Turin shroud is not from the land of Israel. It's just the, the probability that that shroud was made in Israel and dates back to that time is, is low. It is highly improbable that this, this, the, the fabric, forget the mm-hmm. image, the fabric itself, isn't from there be, just because of the weave. So you're talking about a, a, a fabric that wasn't woven as the rest of the, the fabrics that we have, that we actually have the archaeological evidence. We've had scientific studies that say that the red that's, that's, um, you know, the, the color that's is, is made from an ochre, right? Made from this uh, medieval paint essentially that w- was there and other other studies that have said it, this is a medieval, this is a 14th century forgery. And so these guys are coming along saying, yeah, but we have this new technology that says if we x-ray it this way, it could be 2,000 years old. Yes. But, but that is only if it is maintained a temperature and humidity consistency within this very narrow range. Yes which becomes a problem that they acknowledge and acknowledge in a very odd way near the end because they're saying, yeah, the the problems for the preservation of this, why isn't there the natural decay? They don't get into the weave part. They completely ignore that. No, they They do acknowledge the, yeah, there were some fires, but we tested the fire theory and the fire doesn't damage our method of scanning. So they say that they're clear there, but for the humidity... I don't know. I this part you come to it and it's just a sentence that makes you go uh a little bit. Yeah, read it. Read it. Finally, since X-ray dating indicates that the shroud is older than its 7 centuries of European history, we can also argue that it was fortunate that the shroud was carried to Europe 7 centuries ago. And that's one of those moments where you say, yeah, this is that argument that you're lucky we took your thing if if you're arguing that it dates from this period and from this region you're fortunate we took it because we're preserving it for you aren't you so happy you've never heard this come from places like the british museum potentially it's the elgin it's marbles the, yeah yeah we've got it we're taking care of it and in fact in fact we're really doing you a favor because yeah. look at how nice it yeah. is we still have it you would have destroyed it if it weren't for us taking it from you and putting mm-hmm. it in our museum, uh, it would have been lost, the, you know, this forged thing. But because we took it and kept it over here, it... The, it was made for the climate of Europe, they yeah. argue. That was, that, that's <laughs> well, where this shroud was destined to end up. And that's where the research of Orit Shamir comes in. It was made for the climate of Europe because it was made in Europe. It wasn't it's made... All- in Israel, it's not from Palestine. It's not. It's not from Eastern Mediterranean. It's from Europe. It's a wonderful moment where they judo themselves without acknowledging <laughs> that they have just like taken their knees out. <laughs> if they had brought in then that reference, that would have been a wonderful one too. But they're they're going through all of these different ways to try to position it. And if there is a way that this methodology can be used, it would be great. 
They're, yeah. They acknowledge in their article, this is stu still a new technique. It hasn't fully been fleshed out. We don't have all the anchors. It's going against the C-14 dating and the standards. And so we need more research to help pin down, just like with doing things like tree rings and radiocarbon, you need anchors to try to figure out how this goes. It would have been great if they leaned more into that and less of the ideological side. But unfortunately, that's not where they're interested in spending their time. And this is the exact same thing that we said about the whole Mount Abal uh, you know, this whole forgery, it's not a forgery. It's just a, it's a hunk of lead that they're, you know, Rorschach testing the, the scanning that, that they're claiming is being used to produce these images is actually a legitimate piece of technology. It's, it's actually legitimately used to, to the CAT scanning and the, the, that's all a legitimate science. It's just when you take that legitimate technique and then you try to force it and then you make all of these exceptions and you do the mental backflips and you do the Rorschach test in order to, and then you strip out some things and you don't discuss the fact that the fabric's not woven the right way. And you, and then you say, and, and here now it's possible. See, and we're not going to say Jesus, but you know, here it is. And then you just hope and pray or, or you market it properly that it gets picked up by the news and then you just wait and hope that you get a deal signed with, you know, one of these documentary producers. Uh, and then they're going to they're going to put it out there and they're going to say, is it possible? And then I got to go on that show and say what I'm saying right here. I just no, 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 it's not. No. We're, yeah. Legitimate. We're trying scholars. to save save you that production schedule right. listeners of <laughs> waiting a year yeah, for this yeah, discussion. No. No. The, the legitimate scholars, archaeologists, don't. N nobody thinks the Shroud of Turin is real. Now, I said this on Mysteries of the Faith on Netflix. Whether or not something's real, authentic, historical, whatever word you want to use, doesn't mean that people won't find inspiration in the symbolism or the suggestion that something's real, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's a placebo effect or whether... Something doesn't have to be real in order for it to send the mind uh, to thoughts of the heavens, right? To send the, right. send the mind to thoughts of the divine. So, I mean, I, it can be something benign, right? This pen might be very meaningful to me because it was given to me by my great grandfather. And, you know, it, it, there's nothing holy about it. But when I see it, it reminds me of him and it sends me... It, it doesn't have to be a historical artifact. So I say this in the show, the Shroud of Turin is inspirational to many people because when they see it, they're reminded, oh, Jesus was buried. Uh, he had a cloth. Despite the fact, despite the fact that John chapter 20 says there were more than one linens. There was the linen that wrapped his body and the linen that wrapped his face, which was set aside separately. So the Shroud of Turin doesn't even follow the gospel account, right? John 20, this is the first seven verses of 20. Uh, let's look at verse four. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb. He bent down and look in, to look in and saw the linen wrappings, plural, lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter came in following him, went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus's head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So according to the gospel of John, there were two separate pieces of cloth, one for, I guess, the body and one for his face. The shroud of Turin is one piece covering everything. So so, you know, someone will claim, well, those were the wrappings that were on his body. And then this play, this piece was, you have to start making up these apologetic stories mm -hmm. to try to make this make sense. Oh, and by the way, that's not 14th century ochre, right? This isn't paint. It's the blood. And uh, the, the, it was very special imported cloth from Europe to. Yes. 
it was the the importance of the burial. There's that's when all of these things right. start to come in a stack. And yeah, we've got multiple shrouds. That's not a bad thing. This can support because now, hey, we have claims of shrouds more than just this one that might be bearing the face. And so we have the the double wrap, the triple wrap, the the over how many, how many of them do we want to stack up? Well, I guess maybe as many as we need. Keep in mind, you mentioned multiple shrouds, not just multiple shrouds in the tomb. The shroud of Turin isn't the only shroud claiming to be a shroud of Jesus, right? We have the shroud of Oviedo in Spain, which is which purports to be that face cloth, that facial shroud. And it you can look at that one. That's more of a Rorschach test. You're looking at that going, okay, I guess I can see where it, it touched his eyes. But they claim that that was the one that John 20 talks about as being the face cloth, whereas the rest of it was the one that was on the body. And then there's the Manapello uh, image. And that one is, to me, I mean, the, the Im- and we can show it here, that the image... Um, it looks like a portrait painting and you know, it, it, it doesn't look like, you know, something that it just looks like a painting. And of course this one goes back to the tradition uh, of Jesus. It, I think it's one of the stations of the cross, right. On the Via Dolorosa where, where there's a, a somebody wiping the face with a, a piece of cloth and, and this goes in, you have these different traditions there are more than one shroud, right? There's mm-hmm. the Shroud of Turin, but then there's Oviedo, and then there's Manapello. And so there are lots, most people don't know this, there are lots of places that claim to have one of these pieces of cloth that was associated with a burial of Jesus that bears his image. Which and- is the the ticket, because everybody wants why the shroud. The grail gets a lot of attention, nails get a lot of attention, but there's just something different about, is this, right? That question, is this the face? Correct. Is this the face of Jesus? And that's because our brains work this way. We talked about this again, going back to the Mount of All thing. Our brains have a, a very special, it sits right above the ear here, a very special facial recognition software. It's built into our brain. And it helps us not only identify people, but to determine, are they angry? Are they coming at us mad? Are they friendly? It's why smiles and frowns and all that stuff are so important. It's it's part of the fight or flight mechanism. It, it helps mm-hmm. us identify people, whether they friend or foe, and whether we should get out of town if they're coming at us. And so the faces are the things that we tend to see. It's it's when we're when we're looking at the clouds. Hey, is that a face? We're looking at a tree bark. Is that a face? Our brain wants to identify faces because faces are the things that are, you know, potentially going to kill us the worst, right? It could is that a face of a person that a predator that's going to kill us. It sounds weird, but that's how the psychology, that's how we've evolved. We're looking all the time for faces. And if this is face of Jesus, oh right. my gosh. Right. That's is he is he looking upon us? Am I looking upon the face of Jesus? And now they're taking this thing and plugging it into AI. You do what you gotta do. It's you know, it's the year of AI. And so of course, now you may have seen this instead of the headline, and you're wondering why am I seeing AI reconstruction Jesus all over the place in my feed? It's because now, yeah, let's take the image of the shroud and put it in and can building upon maybe it's one one look of this or different edits of this and can we right. produce the face out of this because there's that that deep desire of not just the object but can i see can i see the face can i recognize this which right. feels in the way i i don't know the author's individual positions i know they've published some things before that they've retracted regarding the blood from the shroud. I don't know. Right. We don't know their individual positions on faith. But knowing the importance of this, if there is any uncertainty or doubt, it, it feels like it walks that line of, you know you're getting people on oh, the yeah. thing that's going to get them riled up, which just feels wrong. Well, To, to grab people, you're grabbing them by the thing you know they're going to latch on to. 
and maybe are we misrepresenting and we know it or we're hedging and we're leading and that's one of those things where it's just unfortunate it's just there's a word for it it's called clickbait you you word the, and people do it for good and people do it for bad it's they're writing the article in such a way that people will you know click on it and read it and then you know uh, new other newspapers secondary will report on it and then they can always say well now we didn't say and hey trust me i was an editor of a of a bible archaeology related magazine for some time i know how to do this I watched it done before me for decades. You just ask the question, right? Is it possible that this is it? And then down in the details, you argue through the pros and the cons and all the evidence. But the headline's got to be, hey, is this possible? And people are like, dang it. And they got to read the article. And then people will throw comments and they'll, what are you doing? What are you? That's okay. They already read the article. And so that's, that's how this works. It's clickbait. It's, it's what it is. And so my thing is going back to our earlier discussion, it's not Easter. It's not Christmas. So is there, is there a documentary that I wasn't invited to participate in? Uh, maybe they need some <laughs> funding. Maybe, or, maybe or, the coffers are getting empty and. Oh, well, no. I think it's, they, they know what I'm going to say about it. So maybe they, they need a little bit more, uh, they no, the, the researchers, little... maybe, you know, maybe that they're running a little low on funds and some donors. If you we know, there's a lot attention. of self-produced stuff out there now, right? Yeah. So a lot of this stuff is we're going to produce it. We'll get, we'll get friendlies and come say, mm, it's possible. Uh, which is why, you know, I, I, I like to work with the people that I work with because they'll allow me to go and say, yeah, I don't think this is it, but you know, you, you want, you want these shows that you watch to say like, Yes and no. Yes, I you know, and you have a set of scholars, but PhD after their name that say, yeah, no, this isn't the evidence. And then there's other guys that are like, yeah, man, it's it's. And then you get to make up your own mind, and that's how they sell these shows. And I'm just giving you the inside, right? This yeah. is this is how it works, and it works in scholarship. And please don't think that peer review articles are uh, immune to this. They mm -hmm. they want they want to put their articles out there as well. These are journals. These are magazines. They need to stay in business. Lord knows uh, they're having tough times too. And so they're going to pick up, even if it's a two-year-old article, they're going to pick up the things that they think are going to get the traction. So I don't know. I think we're pretty good on coverage here. If you saw it, that's that's where we stand on it. If you hadn't seen it, you probably will. But now you know some of the backstory. Yeah, just because it comes out in an article, the headline may not be all that's there or where it came out may be a part of why what it says is what it says. If you have questions, if there's follow-ups, if there are follow-ups to this, we'll cover those as well. If they publish a doubling down or a redaction in the future, we'll let you know. We'll cover it here. But yeah, if you have additional questions about this, put them down in the comments, send us an email at bible-archaeology at uiowa.edu. Recommend this, send it to a friend if you enjoyed it. Sharing and subscribing really helps. We appreciate any feedback. And next week, we'll be live on YouTube. So if you have a question that you are itching to ask, you can come and join us live and get your question answered then potentially depending on audience and how we go, but we're happy to see you live for the first Friday of the month right. there on YouTube. If you're an audio only fan, it'll come out just a little while after right. once that recording is over. But Bob, is there anything we need to add about the shroud today before we go? No, did I mention that it's fake? That I, that I, I, I can't remember if I, if I threw that in there, but no. I'm not sure, but I'm glad we, we can grab yeah, it at the end. It, it's fake. That. The shroud of Turin is fake. It's it's a medieval forgery, and that's the end of the story. It's a short version. That's our that's our YouTube short for the day. Um, uh, please put your comments down below. We try to look at these. We try to answer them. And by the way, we're going to be doing the live, as Jordan said. Next week, I'm sure we're going to get some questions on the shroud. I always do. The grail, I don't get as many questions on. It's the shroud. For some reason, the shroud has these just fierce defenders, and they keep coming out telling me about how the science that proved it wrong was all flawed. And so 
bring it. You know, let, let's hear the questions. Bring those questions. Love to discuss it next week. Until next week, for everyone here at Bible and Archaeology, I'm Jordan Jones for Dr. Bob Cargill. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you next week.